students, and this is one of them uh, that I teach this pretty regularly. And uh, and so when I was talking with uh, with Nathan about what I could do, this this is one of the ideas that came up, which is to talk about uh, feedback. So the to kind of set the stage here is, of course, we all know about feedback and we know what happens uh, when feedback occurs and why that's bad and why we like to avoid it. Um, but what I find is that so often uh, the tools that people use first to try to combat feedback are actually the tools they should really use only as a last resort, uh, and that is EQ. Uh, so often, you know, you, the first thing you want to do when, when the system starts feeding back is just reach for that graphic EQ and, and take out the frequency. And maybe you get good enough to where you can recognize the frequencies and you can pick the, the right slider on the first shot, maybe not. Um, the problem with that strategy, of course, is that, you know, you're, you've sat through already many, many uh, seminars about how to get your sound system to sound just perfect and just great and tune it and EQ it and directivity and subwoofer directivity and all these kinds. Of, you're going to do all this work to get it to sound perfect and then to combat EQ you're going to reach over and undo almost all of that work uh, by taking out that EQ because we know that the, and it, well if you don't know, I, let me tell you now, that graphic EQ is nowhere near as surgical as you imagine it to be. Um, in order to take out that one sine wave that is feeding back, you have to take out, you know, a big, big swath of your frequency spectrum just to get rid of one sine wave. Uh, and then, of course, all, all that happens is you get another dB of gain before a different frequency feeds back, and you're notching out something else. And before long, maybe you've got yourself an extra 6 dB of gain before feedback, but now your sound system sounds like trash. Uh, uh, and, you know, if, if that's what you got to do to get through the night, go for it. But there's a better way uh, to get your game before feedback up. So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to start by just acknowledging uh, those that came before me. Uh, and I, the first little half of this demonstration is going to be taken uh, pretty closely from this classic text, the Sound System Design Reference Manual that uh, has gone through several revisions over the years. I think it's still freely available in PDF on JBL's website. Um, I, I'm able to figure out two names of folks who, who I think were involved uh, with this. Um, George Augsburger and uh, John Ergel at, some, at one point or another were involved in this. Uh, and there's a great section in this, in this text about uh, game before feedback. And I'm gonna start by setting the stage using largely kind of the, the way it's presented uh, here before we sort of dive into the specific stuff that I'm uh, interested in. So let me start by uh, pulling up a little set of slides for you. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, potential acoustical gain. Uh, and, to and the idea is we need to understand where feedback comes from to begin with. Uh, I think maybe we all kind of understand it in a really fundamental level, but let's make sure we really understand it. Um, and if we really understand why, why it's happening, we will realize there's some other ways to combat it. Um, but I'm going to talk more about this notion of acoustical gain than I am about feedback. And acoustical gain is the difference between when the, the sound system is turned on as compared to when the sound system is turned off as perceived by the listeners out in the seats. So if we decide not to show up for work, uh, and the sound system doesn't get turned on, uh, the audience will hear something, uh, and that, that something will be whatever is able to happen naturally in the room. Uh, but when we show up for work, we do our, our best work, we turn the system on, and hopefully it's louder, right? And I think we have to keep, sort of keep that in mind that you know, when it comes down to the really basic, fundamental, bare bones part of like what we do, we make stuff louder. So if we fail at that part of it, if we fail at the getting louder part of it, you know, very little else matters. Uh, and so the, the acoustical gain is about how much louder did it get as perceived by the listener when you turn the sound system on. And there are a lot of things that could affect that, but we know that feedback is something that definitely stands in your way of getting uh, that, to be, that gain to be a very large number, which of course we would all really like. Uh, so I first want to sort of talk really briefly about uh, the components of a sound reinforcement system. Um, we know that sound reinforcement systems have microphones and sound reinforcement systems have loudspeakers. Um, I, we prefer to use the term loudspeakers 
because uh, for at least for the purposes of today's conversation, because uh, we could also refer to uh, this person over here. You could call that person a speaker. <laughs> uh, or you could call this thing a speaker. Uh, and so if you use the term speaker, which one are you talking about? The person down here on the stage or the thing that's up here in the air? Uh, so we, we prefer to talk about uh, these as loudspeakers. Uh, and of course, the microphones are part of our system. But we also need to remember that the, there are two other parts of our sound system. And to really understand the gain before feedback, you got to remember that we also have a talker or some other thing that makes noise, could be a musical instrument or whatever. And the other part of our sound system is the listener. Uh, the sound system doesn't do anything if there's no one to listen to it. And we solve the problem of gain before feedback from the perspective of the listener. So let's take a look at, uh, oh, I've also sort of given you a, a preview here of, of what's going on is that trying to get more gain before feedback is actually a geometry problem more than it is a frequency problem. So uh, I've kind of called out here some very specific distances and distance relationships between the pieces of our sound system. I'm gonna call D0 the distance between the talker and the listener. And I'm gonna call D1 or distance one, the distance between the microphone and the loudspeaker. D2 will be the distance between the loudspeaker and the listener. And then DS is the distance between the talker and the microphone. Uh, so now that we understand that, let's take a look at what is actually happening when feedback occurs. So the part that you probably already understand is that you pick up a sound with a microphone, which is, uh, you know, being shown here, that gets put through a couple of different amplification stages and then comes out of a loudspeaker. And then hopefully most of that sound goes out to the audience, but some of that sound is gonna come from that loudspeaker and find its way back into the microphone, okay? And when that happens, you have the risk of feedback. Now, uh, feedback will happen when a couple of different things occur at the same time. One of those things is that the uh, gain around this acoustical path, this electrical acoustical path is zero. And what I mean by that is that the sound from the loudspeaker will hit the microphone at the same level as the sound from the talker, right? So you have your talker here talking into the microphone and when their sound hits the microphone at the same loudness as this sound from the loudspeaker. When that is the same level, that's when feedback happens, okay? And the reason that that's when feedback happens is because uh, there's a certain amount of distance uh, between the loudspeaker and the microphone. And that distance represents a certain period of time. And that period of time or that distance will represent a wavelength of a certain frequency. And whatever frequency has the, a wavelength that is equivalent to that distance or, the, or a period equal to that time uh, and is the loudest frequency that is hitting the microphone, that is the frequency that will feed back first because that's the one that is going to meet the talker's voice at the microphone at the same level. Uh, and so then what happens is this delayed version of this, that whatever frequency it is that lines up perfectly, uh, starts lining up with the, that frequency from the talker. And because it's a zero degree phase relationship, you get a perfect six dB summation at that frequency. So that frequency gets six dB louder, comes back out of the loudspeaker, hits the microphone, now six dB louder, it doubles again, you get another six dB, so on and so forth, and feedback just keeps occurring and it gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Uh, that's what we're trying to avoid. So the main thing I want you to remember about this is that feedback happens when the sound from the loudspeaker arrives at the microphone at the same level as the sound from the talker. That's when feedback happens. Uh, and so if we can avoid that scenario, we can pr prevent the feedback. So let's take a look and figure out uh, how, what the scenario is that would cause this. So I've now put in some distances here for our different values. Now, uh, if we decide not to show up for work and turn on the sound system, then uh, as I say, there's a certain amount of sound that the listener will hear. 
let's assume for just purposes of discussion that ds uh, is one meter uh, and d0 is seven meters in this, in this situation. And let's also assume that the talker is, is talking at 70 decibels sound pressure level at one meter away. So if you measured the sound pressure level coming off the talker at one meter, you would have 70 dB SPL. So uh, if that is true, then uh, we could figure out how loud it is at the listener. Uh, now figuring that out would be uh, the formula to figure that out would be this one, 70, which is the dB SPL, minus 20 times the log of D0 divided by dS. If we plug the numbers in for that, it would be 70 minus 20 times the log of seven divided by one. Okay, when we get that, we would end up with this answer, seven or 53 dB SPL. That's what the listener would hear if we show, didn't show up for work, assuming the talker is talking at 70 dB SPL. So they hear 53 dB SPL, not particularly loud. Um, there's a reason we decided to put a sound system in here. Uh, so in that scenario, we show up for work, we turn on the sound system, the sound system will feed back because the talker is one meter away from the microphone, and we are assuming that the talker is 70 dB SPL at one meter, we know that this, this system will feed back when the sound from the loudspeaker hits the microphone at 70 dB SPL. So when that happens, both the loudspeaker and the microphone are hitting, or the, the loudspeaker and the talker are hitting the microphone at 70 dB SPL, that's when feedback will occur. So if feedback is occurring at that point when the loudspeaker hits the microphone at 70 dB SPL, how loud will it be at the listener? Well, we could figure that out by doing uh, a very similar equation. This would be 70, which is the uh, level of the talker, minus 20 times the log of D2 divided by T D1, D2 being the distance of the loudspeaker to the listener, and D1 being the distance of the loudspeaker to the microphone. So if we just do 20 times the log of D2, which is six, divided by D1, which is four, we will get a dB difference between those two distance distances, okay? And then we can compare that against the 70 dB that we know is hitting the microphone from the loudspeaker. We run that math, we get 66.5 dB SPL uh, when we turn the sound system on. That's how loud it will be, that's, the, the, that's when it feeds back is when we achieve 66.5 dB SPL. Now, uh, what is the gain? The gain is just the difference between the system turned on and the system turned off. So 66.5 minus 53, we get 13 and a half dB of gain, which means we can make this show 13 and a half dB louder by showing up for work and doing nothing but just run the fader up till it gets to the feedback point and then stopping and collecting our paycheck, okay? We will get 13 and a half dB, which is not a particularly staggering uh, amount of gain. Uh, and, and that result of 66 and a half dB is not a particularly loud show. That is quieter than most kind of close contact conversations. Uh, so I, I wanna review this by just taking that math we just did and uh, combining it into a single equation. Okay, so uh, if I just combine what I just did into one long equation, it would look like this. 70 minus 20 times the log of D2 divided by D D1 minus 70 minus 20 times the log of D0 divided by DS. That's just, I just strung together that math we just did into one long equation. Um, however, I now wanna show you a second equation and that's this one down here. This is what I'm gonna call a simplified version of the same problem. So uh, if we run that one through uh, all the steps, I've got them up here, you, you would have, um, uh, you plug in the numbers here uh, for all the different distances. You've got 20 times log of four divided by one times seven divided by six. You run that math, it's 20 times the log of four times 1.67. That's 20 times the log of 4.67, which is 20 times the log of 0.67. And you get an answer of 13.4 which is awfully similar to the 13.5 that we calculated the other way. So it's just a different version of the same equation. But what is missing from that second equation? 
I'm going to let you look at it for just a moment and see if you can spot it. What is different about it? If you have spotted it yet, you might notice that the thing that is missing is that 70, right? That value of 70 is not in the second equation. Uh, and we were able to get the same result without using that number 70. Of course, that number 70 represents the level of the talker. And so what can we conclude by this? We know that the math you know, works. We know that second equation works. It gets you the same answer. But you can get the same answer without having to worry about how loud the person is speaking. So here's the, co the comparison again between the thing we did first over here on the left and the simplified version. We get functionally the exact same answer. What does this tell us? Gain before feedback is independent of the level of the talker. In other words, it doesn't matter how loud they talk. Your gain is the same. Okay, this is usually where about two or three people's minds kind of go uh, So I want to stop for just a second and let you all process that and ask any questions or, or fight with me about what I just said. <laughs> But no questions while we're waiting yet, for that to come in, I do want to just say that I've proven myself correct using math. <laughs> no questions yet, but there's a lots of explosion sounds in the chat, so I guess okay. people's <laughs> minds are blown. Okay, so gain I, before feedback is independent of how loud they speak. Can can I ask a small question? Yeah. How about if you if you modify the input, like let's say that you could get somebody. You could get a guitar amp spitting out at 120 decibels, then some of this would change, right? Your initial number wouldn't that be it'd be higher, right? Well, uh, what would that what would happen is, yeah, your your level when the when the system is turned off would be more, right? Um, and so while it is true that game before feedback is independent of the level of the talker, um, in other words, it doesn't matter how loud the talker is or the instrument is or whatever, your gain is the same. Uh, what is also true is that the amount of gain you need in order to achieve whatever level you're trying to, to achieve, that might be, the, the, the amount of gain you require might be less if the source material is, acoustically is delivering more without your help, right? So if you're able to get to the listener uh, and you still have 75 or 80 dB SPL, naturally, acoustically, at the listener, then the amount that you need to make that louder by might be less, right? The amount of work you have to do might not be as much. Uh, but regardless of how loud that source is, the amount of difference you can make is the same. So when I say we have 13 and a half dB of acoustical gain, what I mean is no matter how loud the thing is to begin with, you can only ever make it 13 and a half dB louder than that. You will never be able to make it more than 13 and a half dB louder than that without changing some variable. Okay. Right. So the so the dB output of the PA system is not in fact fixed. It's just the dB yeah, dB output over the initial source is the fixed quantity, right? Like right. The amount, of gain you can have. the amount of gain is fixed. Okay, unless you change something, and that's what I want to talk about now is what can you change. But any more questions about about this? Anybody else want to? Yeah, sure. We it? have a we have a question from Luis. So what happens if you delay the loudspeaker? I guess he means. Okay, so uh, if we go back to this slide, you know, what you're basically talking about is changing this value, right? That delta time. So what would happen if you, if you add delay is there would now be a different frequency who with that amount of time would have a period that was sympathetic to uh, another frequency that's coming in from the talker. So you would just have a different frequency now that locked into a zero degree phase angle that would then get louder. So maybe the frequency that was feeding back before, you add a little bit of delay, it's not gonna feed back anymore, but a different one now would now. It would be probably a lower one, right? Would now start feeding back. Great, and we have another question from Kendall. Um, what about the distance DS? That will make a difference in how much gain you can have, right? So the distance oh, yes. from the so, presenter to the microphone, right? Absolutely, so that's what we're gonna talk about next, if we're ready to uh, look at that. So. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, let me actually make sure I'm sharing audio with you. Cause did you hear that audio? 
no. So let me, because uh, <laughs> that's the best part. So let me uh, share with you. So uh, I co-wrote a book, um, Digital Sound and Music, uh, and we developed a lot of demos like this for the book. So I'm going to let you look at one of these. Okay, now you get to hear my, my cool audio intro. Okay, so this is just a little uh, demo, interactive demo that uh, we can play around with this concept of acoustical gain. Uh, so I'm not going to read any of this to you because it's everything that I just said. Uh, and we're going to just remind you of the four components of our sound system, which is a loudspeaker, microphone, listener, and some sort of sound source, which I will usually call a talker, but it could be anything that makes, makes sound. There's another part of our sound system which isn't really connected to acoustical gain directly, but is a factor, which is that we also have a, an operator, right? So someone is back there, you know, moving a fader or turning a knob, and that person does affect the scenario somewhat, okay? Uh, so the first thing we want to drive home is that this is, you know, this potential acoustical gain, the amount of gain before feedback we're going to be able to achieve has to do with the distances between the, the comp various components of our sound system. Okay. So um, if we look at it, here's my little equation that I ran you through a minute ago. Uh, and now I'm going to put some math under this little uh, flash demo. And it's calculating live based on these distances that are in, in the animation right now. It's saying, I'm going to have 10 dB of gain. That's when the system feeds back. But here's what's cool about this. I can move some of these things around. And here's where I can show you the, the relationship of distance to gain. So let me move the loudspeaker around. So what if I bring the, the loudspeaker back here? OK, now I only have 2.8 dB of gain, right? No good. Uh, what if I bring it really, really close to the listener? Okay, now I have 31.7 dB of gain. Uh, I could do somewhere in the middle. I can get up to 14. Uh, but yes, of course, I could get the microphone closer to the talker, right? So maybe I get the, the microphone all the way up against the talker. Now I'm at 45 dB of gain. Uh, and you know I could get all the way up to 62 dB of gain by just getting the loudspeaker right there over the head of the listener, OK? Uh, but you can also move other things around. Like, of course, if I could get my listener closer, that, would, that actually, in interestingly enough, reduces your gain because the natural sound gets louder. Uh, so the difference you're making is less dramatic. You can also, of course, move the talker around. Uh, so this is kind of just fun to play with a little bit and see what happens uh, when you load this equation into it to see what happens to your gain. But hopefully, we've seen a few really important relationships here. So if we start and look at this scenario, which is 1 dB of gain, which is basically nothing, we would not get paid for this gig. Uh, this is what would happen. Let, so let's look at the, the first relationship between uh, acoustical gain and the physical distances here. One is that if we can move the loudspeaker farther away from the microphone, gain goes up. OK, we went from 1 dB of gain to 7 dB of gain just by moving the loudspeaker farther away from the microphone. The next relationship is if we can get the loudspeaker closer to the listener and at the same time farther away from the microphone, gain will also go up. Now we're up at 19.5. And then, of course, the next relationship is getting the talker close to the microphone. Now I'm at 41.3 dB of gain. OK, so. Uh, now, before we, I move on to the next little bit of this, I just want to make this point, which is that if you're trying to use EQ to get yourself more gain before feedback, I don't know about you, but the best I've ever been able to achieve with that before it just starts sounding unacceptable is about 6 dB. So I can maybe get another 6 dB of gain using the EQ before it just starts sounding horrible, OK? Uh, but I went from 1 dB of gain to 41 dB of gain without ever having to touch an EQ. I just moved things around a little bit, OK? So uh, now, here's the next thing that can help. We've been assuming so far that our microphone and our loudspeaker are omnidirectional. Uh, but of course, directivity plays a factor in this thing. So let's take a look and see what directivity does. So here's the scenario where I have 4.5 dB of gain, and I've got an omnidirectional microphone. Uh, but if I switch to a, a, a cardioid, now I'm at 16.5 dB of gain. If I switch to a hypercardioid, 
I'm at almost 30 dB of gain. Why? Because I can position the, uh, the loudspeaker so that it's lined up with that cancellation node of the microphone. So even though my talker is still seven feet away from the microphone, I'm, I have 28, almost 29 dB of gain because of that. So microphone directivity can really help. Now, of course, if we can accomplish all these things at the same time, let's get the microphone right close to the talker, let's get the loudspeaker um, you know, right in that node. Now I'm up to 60 dB. Now, what if I went and did this, got the, the loudspeaker right up against the listener and switched the polar pattern to cardioid so that I'm now lined up with the back of it. Now I'm at 84 and a half dB of gain and I haven't touched an EQ yet, okay? So of course we, we, we can leverage the directivity of the microphone to our advantage if we can get the microphone and, and the directivity aimed in such a way where the area of low uh, sensitivity for the microphone is lined up with the loudspeaker, then that's gain that goes up. But the caveat here is that we know that microphones do not exhibit the same directivity for every frequency. So while we might be able to get 84 and a half dB of gain here for really high frequencies, lower frequencies, we're probably not gonna get as much because they're less directional. So that's just a little caveat to keep in mind. Now, of course, uh, you know, loudspeaker directivity plays a factor here as well. And we, you've learned a lot about that in the last session about subwoofer directivity, which can really help game before feedback if you can get those subwoofers to be directional and get that sound off the stage. So, um, you know, if we take a look at directivity of the loudspeaker, I can switch here between a 90 degree, 40 degree and 60 degree loudspeaker. Um, and we could really make something happen here. So if I go to a 40 degree loudspeaker and a hypercardioid pattern, and if I get this lined up just right with the 40 degrees, I'm at 90 dB of gain and I don't have to put the loudspeaker right on top of the head of the listener, okay? Uh, so certainly loudspeaker directivity can help you here. Uh, and this is why big, tall line arrays can, you know, we like those in a lot of ways. Yes, it allows you to shoot a lot of sound a long ways without losing a lot, but it also makes it more directional. You get less sound on the stage. And if you can do all those tricks with subwoofers, get them directional, you can really help this situation as well. Uh, hey Jason, can we take another question from absolutely. Temidea? Temidea, go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask your question, please. So my, my question is, what about if the speaker is in a monitor position? What, what if the loudspeaker is what? Is a monitor position, in a monitor position. Okay, yeah, so um, it's basically the same principle. So I can't, I mean, I, in this animation, I can't put it on the ground, but, but we could put it here, which would be, you know, kind of the mirror image of it being on the ground. So if you could, if it had to be really close like this, um, here again, if you can line it up with the polar pattern of the microphone, so that you could get it you know, in that node, you could still get pretty good game before feedback, even if it's really close, right? Uh, and depending on you know, where the microphone has to point, if the microphone has to, you know, is pointing down towards the floor, uh, and you would probably wanna do one loudspeaker, a monitor wedge pointed straight up, because then it would be, and use a cardioid pattern, because then uh, you would be in the node there. But uh, if you know, the microphone was you know, pointed parallel to the ground, then you might want to do two monitors, one coming out from each side so you could line it up with the supercardioid or the hypercardioid uh, pickup pattern so that because it has the nodes kind of on the side. So the same principle applies, uh, but you really have to use the microphone directivity to your advantage in that scenario. Getting the right polar pattern makes all the difference. And of course, getting the microphone as close as possible to the talker makes all the difference. But you don't have to have the loudspeaker, you know, 50 feet away in order to still get some really good game before you feedback without resorting to EQ. And another question from Kyriakos Papadopoulos. Kyriakos, go ahead. Kyriakos, can you hear us? Yes, can, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, does the type of the transducer of the microphone has an effect on the potential, um, I mean, a dynamic or a condenser microphone? Um, so, probably not. Uh, only, I mean, so, of course we know that, that condenser microphones uh, are a bit more sensitive, right? So they produce a more voltage, uh, you know, with less sound, but, uh, but the same, I mean, the feedback will happen nonetheless, 
when the sound from the talker and the sound from the loudspeaker hit the mic at the same level. And that's whether it's a dynamic or a condenser mic. Uh, that scenario will be the same. Um, but you pretend, if, if you have gain to spare, if you've got acoustical gain up the wazoo and you, and you switch to a uh, condenser microphone, then you potentially are getting more voltage onto your, your cable with the same amount of sound pressure level, which then could translate into more voltage that goes into the power amplifier, which then translates to more sound coming out of the loudspeaker. Uh, but you know, that just means you, know, you could make more sound assuming you still have headroom, right? And maybe you don't if you haven't got the game feedback you know, figured out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what else? Can I a ask if, uh, so, so based on the fact that your distance is constantly, when your distance changes, your frequency is going to change, uh, like your, the frequency of which you feed back or um, when the alignment uh, phase-wise occurs. So essentially you could take a speaker and EQ that speaker out. Uh, I mean, you could take a microphone, EQ it for feedback, but the minute you move it, the relationship's going to change. So the only way to really, is, is it my understanding here that the only way to really EQ a system or EQ the microphone in the system is if it's going to stay still, right? If it's going to stay still, um, or you have to have, you know, you have to have some sort of automatic EQ, you know, the, well, there's these you know, feedback exterminators basically, which are just automatic EQs that recognize when these sine waves get out of control. And so as you move it around, a new one gets out of control and it tries to notch it out. But eventually you obliterate quite a bit of your frequency spectrum doing that. Um, so, but yeah, moving around is tough. Um, so it, if your loudspeaker is really close to the microphone, like in this situation, then yeah, moving around makes a pretty big difference. Uh, you know, as I move around, I, I can go from 85, you know, to 40 pretty quickly. Um, so moving does have a different, make a difference when the loudspeaker is close. If it's, pretty far away, it make, has less of an impact, right? Because the difference in relationship is not as much, um, especially if you've got plenty of gain to spare. I mean, I guess this, this conversation affects monitoring quite a bit, basically. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, so all the more reason to be very specific and very careful about what sounds you put through the monitors, right? Um, if you don't have to put the sound of that microphone through that monitor, then boy, that would help you a whole lot. If you have to put the sound of that microphone through that monitor that's right next to it, then the positioning of that microphone relative to that monitor and the polar pattern of that microphone is critical. Like you gotta get that right. Uh, the other thing that I found is that, of course it's the low frequencies that feed back first. Why? Because they're the least directional. Uh, so if you've got a monitor wedge there um, and, it, and you start shooting all the sound uh, back up at that microphone, the low frequencies are the loudest, they're the least directional, they feed back first. And so the only bit of EQ I usually will, will do is, is just a high pass filter, right? If you can high pass filter something uh, and filter out frequ the frequencies that you don't care about, that you don't need anyway for, to get the sound you're looking for, then that can contribute to your gain without negatively affecting the sound quality. Uh, so that's about the only little bit of EQ that I'll allow myself to do to, com to potentially combat feedback is just a little bit of high pass filtering to filter out those low frequencies I don't care about. What else? Uh, Liam just came on with a question. What about when the talker cups the mic and turns your cardioid or hyper into an omni? Yeah, so that really stinks. Um, because if they cover up the back of the mic, it's the back of the mic with all those holes in it that make it directional. So when they cover that up, it goes omni, it feeds back, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know what to do with that about that because Physics now is working against you. Uh, and, but I can say that as soon as they get a big squeal in their ear every time they cover up the back of the mic, <laughs> you know, that might teach them a little bit of a lesson, right? So I, I, uh, asked, I asked that question to, to be a little bit of devil's advocate just because right. it's a challenging thing that we all have to deal with as people have bad mic technique very Absolutely. frequently, right? Absolutely. You know, so. So it plays a factor for sure. And it really stinks when that happens. So, um, you know, at that point, yeah, your only option might be an EQ. Uh, but just know that that at best is really only going to get you about 6 dB more sound before it starts sounding like crap. Sure. Uh, and, 
and so maybe you don't care. Maybe you don't care how well the monitor sounded. Maybe you, you just, you, you tell the, the performer, well, if you must cup the mic, then you have to be okay with the monitor sounding awful. Um, <laughs> uh, or you can hold the mic differently, you know? I mean, they have to make that value choice, I guess. And one last question from David. So does flipping the polarity of the wedge reduce the chance of feedback as it increases your gain? Ah, very interesting question. So um, let me see if I can uh, illustrate this. So here's what happens. Remember I said that you're going to have, I'm going to draw just a little sine wave here, right? So you've got a sine wave and then you end up with another one that lines up with a perfect zero degree phase angle, right? Um, that's coming from the loudspeaker. This is going to perfectly reinforce, right? And make uh, feedback when it hits the mic from the loudspeaker. So the question is, well, what if you invert the polarity? Well, what would happen here is you're basically going to do this and now that would cancel out. So yeah, now that frequency would no longer um, feed back, right? But uh, now what's going to happen is there's just going to be a different frequency now that with that polarity inversion now is going to be a wavelength that is half of the one before that is now going to be perfectly lined up that becomes uh, 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 reinforcement and gets louder. So yeah, you could invert the polarity and kill the, the frequency that happens to be feeding back right now, but uh, undoubtedly you're going to do that and maybe you'll get you'll be able to push your fader another millimeter up and then a new one's going to kick in and be just as problematic okay have, have okay, we exhausted looks, the questions like for now every, everything is covered so uh, we can press okay on. so let's take a look here at the next situation so now i just want to talk about uh, just to kind of drive the, the concept home here, um, I think m maybe you've all gotten this already, but uh, there is a scenario here where we would have no gain before feedback, right? And here is a, a distance relationship that we could work with where it, the answer here would be zero. Uh, and what does that actually look like? What does that mean to the person operating the sound system? Um, so here's our, our poor operator here. Um, and there in this scenario, let's give them one dB of gain right with 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 this situation uh let's let's see what they're going to see so um they're going to have their fader in front of here and they're pushing the fader pushing the fader and right and this blue area is where you're not ch making a difference right you haven't made it loud enough to where it sounds different um i don't know if you can hear it but my neighbor is apparently destroying a tree next door uh hopefully that's not <laughs> every time um so uh you're going up in the blue and then when you get into the green is where you can start feeling like you've made a difference. It's getting louder, right? So, oh, okay, I'm nothing, 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 nothing. Uh, okay, it's just, I'm, I'm doing something, yay, and then all of a sudden it feeds back, right? Anybody been in that scenario, right? Where <laughs> you're like, I'm doing nothing, 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 something feedback, right? Um, and that is gonna be a really, really rough night, okay, if that's your scenario. Um, and if you haven't solved the feedback problem by then and the show is going and this is your situation, then yeah, grabbing that graphic EQ might be your only option to get through the night if you can't change any of these variables. But maybe uh, if you could figure this out ahead of time and do nothing else but simply get that talker closer to that microphone, uh, now I'm at 22 or 23 dB of gain. Now what's my operator looking at? Okay. Nothing, 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 something, something more, something more, something more. Oh, even more. Yeah, baby. Yeah. All the way up to unity. I can even go farther. Yeah. I'm doing all this work. And before I ever hit feedback, I almost have to bury the fader before I hit feedback. Okay. So of course, this is the scenario we want to be in. We've got 20 dB of playroom to mix here where we're making a difference that people can hear. We're probably going to get paid pretty well for that gig, right? Uh, and all we had to do is get the microphone closer to the talker. Uh, all right, so that is uh, just, that's the, the end of the visual aids. So uh, at this point I can open up in my last 10 minutes or so to more questions or if anyone else wants to uh, argue with me about it, I'm happy to entertain that. Sure, uh, we have a question from Robert uh, who says, what baffles me a bit is that everything sounds fine when the band plays, but as soon as they take a short break or suddenly get quiet, sometimes I run straight into feedback. Can you explain what happens there? Yeah, so um, 
a lot of this has to do with decorrelation. Um, because if you've got in, in, in a, you know, we're assuming it's for all of the demonstration I've given so far, we've been assuming one microphone and one sound source, right? But when you get multiple microphones and multiple sound sources and you start mixing them all together and they, uh, they come out of a, that sound comes out of the loudspeaker, what's coming out of the loudspeaker that's hitting the microphone is a much more complicated sound than what is coming into the microphone from whatever the thing that microphone is up against, okay? Uh, and it, that decorrelation of that sound makes it harder for it to feed back uh, because of all these changing variables that are coming into this, make, making this very complicated sound. So the, um, the second all that complicated stuff goes away and you're left with room tone <laughs> and all those mics, which is very simple, uh, now you don't have all that decorrelation to get in the way uh, and suddenly you know, finding frequencies that lock into a phase relationship and boom, you get feedback. So in that situation, when you're getting that room tone that's now feeding back after the rest of the band has stopped playing, using these principles that we've just looked at and this amazing visual aid, what is best practice there? What do you suggest? You have to start mixing, <laughs> right? So you yes. know, the, the, the problem there is you've got all these mics open, picking up nothing but room tone, right? So you got to start taking them out, right? <laughs> Get some out. Only, only use the ones that are actually picking something up, right? So uh, that's, the, the, and that, that's the answer to that scenario is you have to start mixing. Cool. Other questions? Uh, everybody wants to know if they can get their hands on this amazing app that you've been using or this. Ah, uh, yes. Thing. Okay. So let me now, I, since you asked, I can now do my shameless plug, uh, which is that I wrote a book. And uh, you can get to that book by going to digitalsoundandmusic.com. Uh, you can get this book in print on paper if, if that's your thing. Um, and there's a link down here at the bottom to that, but uh, that will cost you 50 or 60 bucks from the person who decided to publish this book. But this, uh, this work was actually funded through a National Science Foundation research grant. Uh, and be, so we actually made far more money writing this book than we will ever make selling it. And so we are giving it away for free online because we've already made our money. So you can go in here and read the whole thing on here. So if you go to the curriculum link here, you can go into every chapter and read every single part of this book for absolutely free. Uh, and then what you'll notice as you go through it is you might see a little link here for like a flash tutorial about sampling and aliasing. Um, or here's, one, here's a flash tutorial about quantization. Um, and here's one for dynamic range. So if we just sort of like click one of those, it comes up, hopefully. You're all doing it right now, so it's probably taking the site down, but uh, yes, please use Flash. I know it's Flash, I'm working on it. I don't know, I'm not sure what to do. We made this, this stuff a long time ago. Uh, but uh, when this comes up, uh, you'll get the whole thing. And here you can interact with this one. This one is about dynamic range and what that means, you can click through that. Now, if you just say, just give me the game before feedback one, uh, you can go to the curriculum and go to learning supplements. And from here, uh, you'll have a list of all of the supplement, supplemental material, which I think is way better than the written text. I mean, you can read the text if you want to, but I think it's the demos like this that are pretty awesome. So uh, I've got flash demos. I've got Mac, if, you like, if you've ever used Max MSP, I've got a ton of those and, uh, uh, that you can play around with and you can download the Mac software for free and run all these demos and there's lots of really cool stuff in there. Um, we've got some practical hands-on exercises, some videos that you can watch. And then if you are somebody who likes to code, I've got MATLAB demos of all this stuff as well as sort of C++ and Java programming exercises. But to find the acoustical gain one, you go to flash tutorials, here they all are, and you wanna find potential acoustical gain and you pull that up and you get the whole shebang. And you can go through this and, and wow all your friends uh, and you, know, use, you can use this as a fun party trick. So uh, go there for free. Now, if you are someone who teaches or you wanna teach yourself stuff, um, you might notice that I am currently logged in as an, what's called an educator access, which means some of these like practical exercises have these yellow links these are solution files. 
So, uh, and the solution file is like, maybe there's a project I'm giving you to do like here, make your own Helmholtz resonator using a Coke bottle. Uh, and if you want to find out the way to actually get the right answer, you can go, go, you can go to the solution and we've got it all laid out. The same thing is there for the programming exercises. Like there's a, there's one here where we've created a, uh, subtractive synthesizer and we have you add an LFO to that or program a modulation wheel into that. And we give you a solution file, which shows you how to do it to get the solution files. You have to sign up for like a login. Um, and it, it, if you weren't logged in, it would say here, sign up for educator access. Uh, you have to fill out a little form. Um, there's a little test there in that form that says, tell me your educational affiliation. And you just have to put something in there that looks like a human typed it, <laughs> uh, as opposed to a computer. Because a computer would type something nonsensical, but a human would type something that made sense. So just type something that makes sense, and then I'll see it and I'll prove it. And then when you log in, you'll see the solution files. And again, that's all free. You don't have to pay a dime for that. That looks amazing. Um, Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, sure. We have a bunch of them in the chat now. Uh, so David wants to know if we play around with the distance, we don't need to cut the room resonance frequency. Um, well, so, you know, room resonance is really, you're talking about like standing waves inside of the room. Uh, and that's kind of a, that's a, that's a, basically a totally different deal, right? Is when, you, when you've got a, a room resonance or, or a standing wave somewhere, you're gonna have places in the room where a frequency is very loud and places in the room where a frequency is very quiet. Um, there's actually no way to EQ around that because uh, it's not a problem of EQ, it's just a problem with the room. So to solve that problem, you would have to treat the room in some way, move a wall, uh, may, maybe acoustically eliminate a wall with, with absorption or something like that, but, um, you know, EQ might solve that problem for you where you happen to be standing, right? You're standing in a spot where you are in either the, the node or the anti-node of that, of that resonant frequency. And you might be able to hear a difference when you start messing with EQ, but everyone else in the room that isn't standing in the exact spot that you're in is gonna hear something different when you start manipulating that EQ. So my advice is use the EQ to solve problems that everybody hears, not problems that only one person hears. Great. Um, Elliot, Elliot would like to know, what's your opinion on using a second set of loudspeakers further from the source as the main pair and de decreasing the level on the, of the closer loudspeaker? Yes, another trick, right? So we didn't get into that, but yeah. So maybe the thing that's really close to the stage, you're just using for imaging purposes, right? To get a sense of the sound coming from there. It doesn't have to be very loud. And the thing, therefore the thing that is really loud could be way farther away from the stage. Um, absolutely. Uh, then you know you you get more gain that way, right? You don't have the thing that's close to the stage that has little gain before feedback doesn't need a lot of gain, whereas the thing really far away could have all the gain you need. Absolutely, totally valid approach. Oh wow, my email inbox is lighting up here with uh, educator access requests, so I'll tackle those uh, later today. <laughs> Great. Um, so Dakota wants you to touch on using multiple wedges for one talker. Pros and cons. So the main, the main advantage of using multiple wedges would be uh, if, you know, depending on where the microphone has to be, going to two wedges would really be a matter of uh, if you are, need to get into uh, the, a polar pattern of like a, a super cardioid where it's got the nodes coming at you from a side angle, that's where the two wedges can really help you. Uh, but if you're wanting to use a cardioid microphone, you really want to do one wedge right behind the microphone because that's where the note is and that's where you're going to get the, the most gain off of that, okay? So that's the, the real decision about one wedge versus two has to do really with the directional uh, properties of the microphone. Just to build on that, um, there were a lot of theories on you know, placing the, the HF speakers of a, of a wedge, especially in a two wedge scenario on the inside, on the outside. Do you have any uh, insight on that? Um, well, so, you know, every, every loudspeaker that has a horn on the top and a low on the bottom is gonna have a little notch in its frequency response, you know, on the, on the side where the, where the horn is. Uh, and it has to do with where the crossover frequency is between the two drivers, right? You're gonna have this little notch where that distance between the drivers gets a little canceled out uh, and that could maybe help you, right? If you leverage that notch to your advantage, that's one less frequency you have to worry about feeding back. Uh, 
Um, but I think more importantly, the decision of facing them in versus out has to do with figuring out how to avoid the comb filtering between them, right? So if you can, what you don't want to do is have, you know, one facing in and the other facing out because then uh, the overlap, the phase response of the two loudspeakers in that overlap is different and therefore you can't get them lined up in such a way where they don't comb filter. So it's really about picking either or, either both horns facing in or both horns facing out and then you can get them angled in such a way that you don't have ridiculous comb filtering in between. Cool. Uh, one more question from Craig. So we've established where you put your speaker relative to your mic and the polar patterns of the speaker and microphone. Uh, all of this helps, but where's the controversy? We were prom promised to have some <laughs> arguments with you. Well, the argument is, is about the EQ, right? You know, like I'm saying, you don't have to ever touch your EQ. And uh, so the argument, the, 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 the controversy is, is, uh, is sometimes people want to fight with me about that. It's like, yeah, but, you know, so-and-so roadie with a whatever told me that, you know, that's the only way to do it. And, you know, and they're really popular and, you know, they've written a lot of books too. And aren't they right too? And, you know, my answer is, yeah, they're right. That, you know, at the end of the day, when the show starts and you've got feedback and you can't move anything around, then yeah, maybe the only way you get through the night is by grabbing that EQ and starting to completely obliterate the frequency response of your sound system. That might be the only way you get through the night and still have a paycheck by the end of, of, of the show. Uh, but I'm saying it's a better, there's a better way, right? Uh, you can actually predict exactly when the sound system will feed back uh, using this math. And you can know it ahead of time before you ever turn the thing on. And you'll know that you have the problem before you ever even set the system up. And you can solve it before you've spent all the time to fly the array up in the air into the wrong location. <laughs> now that you've mentioned the array, uh, here's a question that is, has been in my mind. So where do you measure the distance from the speaker to the microphone? Is it the acoustical center, the top of the array, the bottom of the array? Well, the truth is the difference between, you know, between the, the edge of it versus the middle of it and everything is, is not going to make a significant difference as far as loudness, right? Because the feedback happens when the sound from the loudspeaker hits the microphone at the same level as the talker. And, you know, whether you're measuring from the bottom of the, of the cabinet, the middle of the cabinet, or the top of the cabinet is not going to be a dramatic difference in level, right? Uh, might be a, D, a dB or so. Now, if it's a big line array, okay, that's a, that's a different deal gets a bit more complicated there. But if it's just a point source box, you know, I don't know that it really matters. I mean, the difference between a, a foot or something does not change that, that logarithm math dramatically. Cool, thanks. Okay, guys, we've uh, sort of uh, tackled every question in the chat box. So if you have any more questions for Jason, you can type them in um, or unmute yourself and do maybe a couple of questions on your own. Um, so for those of us who work in places where we can't move our speakers around, um, is, a, is an estimation that moving the microphone away from the edge of the stage and getting the person closer to the microphone, that's, that's basically what we're talking about here. Yeah, that, those are the tools at your disposal, right? So we know that getting a loudspeaker farther away from the microphone helps. So if you can't move the loudspeaker, you got to move the mic. So uh, you can move the mic, yeah, further upstage, get it farther away from the loudspeaker, that will help. If you can do that and get it closer to the, to the thing making the sound, even better. Uh, so those are the main tools at your disposal is getting that mic placement right. You know, getting in the, if you can get that mic in the right place, your gain will go up. Uh, Liam wants to know, did anybody ask about horns in or out for HF feedback reduction when setting wedges? Yeah, we just talked about yeah, that. Yeah, we just talked about that. That's really more about comb filtering than, than game for feedback, but sometimes having comb filtering could increase your gain, right? <laughs> because you've got a lot of frequencies that have gone away. So some, that's where the, that, it's, it's a bit of a myth, right? That, oh, if you control that, you can increase your gain. Now what's really doing is making comb filtering and the comb filtering is doing what your feedback exterminator does, which is notch out a whole bunch of frequencies and now your gain goes up a little bit. <laughs> Okay, Craig wants to know if you've done an experiment with other ways to decorrelate the signal. Um, yeah, I mean, decorrelation, uh, you know, reverb is a great way to decorrelate a signal. Um, that can help sometimes. Uh, you can certainly, um, you know, mix other sounds into it, right? So, you know, the, the more complicated you can make the sound that's coming out of the loudspeaker compared to the sound that's coming from the talker or the instrument or whatever, 
the more complicated you can make that sound that comes out of the loudspeaker, the more decorrelated it is, the less, the harder it's going to be for that to lock into a phase, a zero degree phase relationship with something and feedback. So anything you can do to make it more complicated, like make a million copies of it <laughs> and mix it together, which is what reverb does, right? That makes it really complicated and it makes it a lot harder for one frequency to find a, a, a clear path. So you can actually fight feedback with reverb. That's a Great, great suggestion. <laughs> um, a little bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, of course. Uh, Elliot wants to know, what about training the talker to talk louder at the mic? Any tips on mic technique or speaking technique? Um, you know, I, I, it, we can't do that, right? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't make the performer do something different. I, it's not within my power. Um, all I can do is try to create the best scenario I can for the way they're going to do it. And then uh, if that's not generating the result we need, then I have to get someone who does have control over that person to get them to behave differently. So I can't do that, but a producer or a director or a whoever is in charge of that person can make them do that. Um, and so when I get that note from, a, I mean, I work in theater, so I get the notes from the directors. Like, can't you make them louder? It's like, no, because they're holding the microphone down at their waist. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you want that louder, you got to go tell them to get the microphone up inside their mouth. Right. And I can't have that conversation with them. Uh, it's just not my place. Right. Um, I'm not even really allowed to talk to them without a director's permission. Uh, so, but a director can do that. And if the director gives, is the one that gives me the note, then yeah, the director will walk up there and say, you know what, get the mic out of your pocket and stick it up in front of your mouth. And then when they hear the result, then everyone's happy. <laughs> so that's my strategy for that. I don't, try to waste a whole lot of time myself trying to train performers. I rely on the people who are already training performers to train them. Um, and I find I get much better results that way. And hope for the best, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Evan wants to know, how does the room's reverb decay factor into the potential gain? It makes it less actually, because um, you know, when you get the more reflective energy you get off the room, that's now contributing to your, what your, is effectively your noise floor. Reverb is a form of noise, right? From an intelligibility point of view. So as, uh, as the room is reflective, you get more sound coming at you, your noise floor goes up, uh, which means the ability of your uh, listener to hear the natural sound clearly coming directly off the stage is diminished and therefore your gain is not as good. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. The drier you can make the room, uh, the, you're, the better chance you're going to have of, of making this work. If you've got a really reflective room, you're going to have a hard time um, because it definitely affects intelligibility and poor intelligibility means you need more gain in order to understand what they're saying. And maybe you don't have it. So if you could make the room deader, then you need less gain and then you, have, you don't have to move things quite as dramatically. Great. Um, from Big Man, how do you approach mixing lapel mic to get a lot of gain before feedback? I never put it on the lapel. <laughs> I put it on their head, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, cause yeah, down here is, is not as helpful as somewhere up here on their head. So anywhere you can get it on their head, the better. I actually did some research on this. I'm about ready to publish it. Um, I, I, with my graduate students in December, we went into an anechoic chamber uh, and used a whole bunch of different omnidirectional lav mics and put them at all different places. Some, you know, we put one down here on their, on their chest or lapel, and then we put it at different spots on their head and we measured the difference in level and frequency response and all of that. Um, and I tell you that where it sounds the best and is the loudest and everything is right here. <laughs> if you can get it right here on their forehead, that's the best. It sounds the best there. And it's, it's very loud. Back here, the ear is, is really quiet. The amount of sound you lose going from here and wrapping around their head to the ear is a lot. It's not quite as much as what you get going from here down to their chest, but it's close. So here sounds the best because it's symmetrical with their face. Um, here on the cheek or close is, is better, but you're, not, you're out of symmetry there, so the frequency response is not as good. Uh, but yeah, I don't put it on the lapel. I'll try to get it on their head as much as possible. Um, if you absolutely must clip it to their shirt, you get it as high up as you possibly can, as close to their, their mouth as you possibly can. And yeah, I can see a chat here. Yeah, putting on, if, if they're wearing glasses, easy, right? <laughs> you just, you know, uh, do a little Hellerman, Hellerman sleeves around their glasses, their, the glasses rims, get it right there, you're golden. 
Yeah, I watched a video on uh, Broadway production for Hamilton, I think, where they put uh -huh. the microphone into the crown, so into yep. the, the costumes of one of the, the one of the members. So I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so big man's pastor doesn't like headborn. So what do you advise? Well, then uh, he's going to have to deal with having not very much gain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like it's, at some point, it's a trade-off, right? It's like, well, you know, if, if he's saying, I need you to make it louder, and you're saying, well, I'm out of tricks. The only trick I have left is for you to put this on your head. Uh, and he says, well, I'm not going to put it on my head. Then the answer is, well, then I can't help you, right? <laughs> I've, done, I've done what I can do. Uh, and, and that might mean that, you know, maybe he'll say, well, you know, I'll find another sound engineer who can, who can do it. It's like, good luck. Fine, go find that person. Um, because if you've done everything you can do, if you've done the physics right and you've moved everything right, there's no other sound engineer in the room that's going to be able to get a better result. Jason, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have to work a few times with uh, flamenco guitar players, and they like to have the wedge right on, on a chair right, right next to them. Yeah. So what I found is that, of, of course, the the wedge is, you know, it's not as loud. Uh, but what would be the relationship between, you know, um, getting the wedge closer and, and, and lower the volume or, you know? Well, you know, remember, it'll feed back no matter what when the sound from the wedge hits the microphone at the same level as the guitar is hitting the microphone. So even though you've turned the wedge down, if it's close, then, you know, as soon as, as long as as soon as it's at the same loudness as the actual instrument, it's going to feed back. So um, in that scenario, really your only option is going to be directivity of the microphone, right? You've got to somehow position it so you can get the node of the microphone somewhere aligned up with the path of the wedge. And sometimes that mo it involves moving things around. And I do that all the time. I'll go down, you know, again, I move in theater a lot and uh, I'll go down to the pit all the time. And I get musicians who think they know about microphones and you know they'll put the microphone somewhere that they read in a book makes it sound good and i'll say no you put it there i don't have any gain right and i'll take it and i'll move it i'll, I'll put it on a boom stick it out to the side and point it into from adam from the side because that then the node is pointed towards the the wedge and i get more gain and they look at me like i have no idea what i'm doing and i say listen you play i do the mic you know <laughs> and uh and we get so that that's really the only option at that point if the wedge has got to be that close to them And that might mean a less optimal microphone placement from a sound quality point of view, right? Maybe getting the microphone in, oriented in the right way where you get that, the, the node in the right way might mean that you don't have as good of quality that you're picking up as the instrument. But would you rather s compromise the quality a little bit and have more gain? Usually, yeah, right? Uh, because it doesn't matter how good the quality is if no one can hear it. <laughs> Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then I'm gonna thank Jason for his contribution to the Live Sound Summit this year. It was a great presentation. Uh, everybody, I can hear.